It's an honor and a privilege to be here today to introduce you to Dr. Stanley Prusner and to the UCSF Neurosciences Initiative. Today, 50 million Americans suffer from neurological disorders that have no cure. That's nearly 20% of the American population. Each of us undoubtedly knows at least one person whose life is impacted by such a disorder. The toll of these diseases can be catastrophic. They are both emotionally and economically tragic for the patients, their families, and our larger community. Just in the United States, the cost of brain-related illness are estimated at $600 billion. As the co-chair of the Neurosciences Initiative, it is my goal to ensure that Dr. Prusner and the 100 plus investigators have a home where they can work collaboratively under one roof at Mission Bay. This home would make UCSF's Mission Bay the most dynamic site for translational neuroscience in the world, focused on curing neurological disorders and diseases. UCSF already receives more NIH funding for neurological research than any other institution in the country. Within the walls of this new building, UCSF has the opportunity to define the future of research and care. They will develop and test better treatments and hopefully cures for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, stroke, autism, traumatic brain injury, and many others. We need to get this building built and we need your help to do it. This new building can do for neuroscience what Silicon Valley did for computer science. For us to succeed as a region and as a state, we need to continue expanding Mission Bay's status as the global center of biomedical research. Dr. Prusner is here to explain far better than I can the magnificent discoveries that will be made in this new building. Now, you often hear that someone is a world-renowned something, um, but Dr. Stanley Prusner is a truly world-renowned neuroscientist. He's a medical doctor and researcher. He's a professor of neurology at, and director of the Institute of Neurodegenerative Diseases at UCSF. He's a Nobel laureate and last year was awarded the Presidential Medal of Science. He is a member of the National Academy of, Sci of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts, and the American Philosophical Society. If there exists an award or a prize or an honor, Dr. Stanley Prusner has already earned it. So with that, let me present to you Dr. Stanley Prusner. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about what we're doing. So what I want to tell you about uh, was described briefly by Katherine Feinstein. I want to tell you about this initiative that we have started to try to cure some of the most awful diseases that afflict humans. And these are nervous system diseases. And we want to do this on the Mission Bay campus. It's a new campus that is booming and growing. And it's being made possible by this wonderful new building championed by Dick Blum, whose name was mentioned earlier by John DeLuca. As you heard, we we're hoping to develop treatments for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, a rare disease, but an important one, multiple sclerosis, stroke, autism, 
headaches, and the tauopathies that I want to spend some time talking to you about, because I'm sure very few of you know about this area. It's an exploding new area of biology and medicine. The building, shown below in an architectural rendering, is about 240,000 square feet. We'll be able to recruit 16 new faculty, another 50 new faculty, 50 fac existing faculty will move into the building, and we'll be focused on treatments for these horrible diseases that I've already mentioned. Now, to cure these diseases, we need some exceptional scientists, and we need the specialized laboratories and equipment that this building allows us to bring forward. I thought I would start with this remarkable quote by Ian McEwan that comes out of one of his novels called Saturday, where he writes, it's still not known how this well-protected one kilogram or so of cells actually encodes information, how it holds experiences, memories, dreams, and intentions. That mere wet stuff that can make the bright inward cinema of thought, of sight, of sound and touch, bound to a vivid illusion of an instantaneous present. Could it ever be explained how matter becomes consciousness? As long as scientists and institutions remain in place, the explanations will refine themselves into irrefutable truth about consciousness. So there are a whole group of people in this building who are interested in this very problem of how the nervous system works, how it functions, and then there are another group of people interested in how to keep it functioning. Now, my own work really begins 25 years ago in the Bay Area at a time when people thought that a disease like mad cow disease, which was not known at that point, but Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease of humans, which was known, was caused by a slow-acting virus. But it became very clear after about eight years of work that a protein, not a virus, was the cause of the disease. The person you see at the top here is George Balanchine. And board George Balanchine from 1979 to 1983, was suffering from Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but not a single neurologist in New York City or Washington, D.C. was able to make the diagnosis during life. It was only after he died that this diagnosis was made. And a year ago, I questioned whether the diagnosis was right. We were able to find the blocks containing the tissue from his brain and then we did a staining study, and this is Steve DeArmond's work that you see at the bottom here, and you see all this brown staining. That's the prion protein proving that, in fact, he died of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Now, this protein we call PRPSC, and in Alzheimer's disease, it's become clear over the last 20 years that another protein, APP, is the cause of disease. In Parkinson's, it's another one called synuclein, and then there are there's the tau protein that causes what are called frontotemporal dementias, uh, studied extensively at UCSF by Bruce Miller, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy that I'll say more about. But what I want you to walk out of here understanding is that there's not a single therapy that slows any of these horrible brain diseases. And in these diseases, a protein shown in the green circle is converted to the red square which is pathologic and causes the disease. And these red squares accumulate, they polymerize into long fibers, and then they're deposited as plaques, tangles, or for instance in Parkinson's disease, Lewy bodies. Now, very smart people develop Alzheimer's disease. Ronald Reagan developed Alzheimer's disease. Rita Hayworth, as shown here, developed Alzheimer's disease. And there are 36 million people, most of them with Alzheimer's disease, worldwide. And this number is going to grow and grow over the next 40 years. The majority of these people who are demented have Alzheimer's disease. And the cost last year in 2010, what I call dementia care, of taking care of these people worldwide was $600 billion. That makes it the 18th largest economy on the planet between Turkey and Indonesia. And we in the United States spend a third of that, 200 billion. Now, if you look around the tables, and if you don't die of heart disease or cancer, and you're 85 years old, if you're all sitting here 
some years from now, every other person will be demented with Alzheimer's disease. That's a horrible thought. Now, the disease uh, bears the name of a neuro German neurologist. And Alois Alzheimer looked at a patient for five years. She was 51 when he first saw her, and she died at 56 in an asylum in Frankfurt, Germany at the turn of the previous century. And at autopsy, he found both these large plaques shown at the bottom and these tangles, these smaller collections, in this very shrunken, atrophied brain as shown here. So Alzheimer was the person who discovered plaques and tangles. And it took us nearly 100 years to figure out what's in these tangles and what's in these plaques. But we now know that in the tangles, a protein called tau, which I'm going to say much more about, is there, and it forms long fibers, just as I told you before, and then these tangles. Now, let me just show you a graph. It's what's going to happen if we don't find a cure or a set of drugs that really modify the course of Alzheimer's disease. Over the next 40 years, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease will increase threefold. We'll have about 15 million of them in the United States. The annual cost will increase from 200 billion to 1.2 trillion annually. And the entire expenditure to take care of all of these people under this curve, if you integrate it, is 20 trillion. And what about research to cure it at the NIH? See that little red bar at the bottom? It never really increases. It goes from 400 million to 600 million. We really have to change the course of history. Now, one of my themes today is how people at universities try to think differently about problems. Because when we're thinking down a straight line and we're not opening our minds to other ideas. And I can tell you that in my own case, for 30 years, I kept thinking about this tangle. And nearly 25 years ago, that it was shown that the tangle contained tau. But it took another half a dozen years for people to agree on this. And over the years, it also became clear to me that these tangles seem to creep into very many different neurologic diseases. But what I want to focus on is traumatic brain injury at the top, shown here. But I want to tell you that, of course, as I said a moment ago, Alzheimer's disease, we see tangles. We see them in rabies infection in the brain. We see them in these lipid storage diseases called Niemann-Pick disease. And on and on goes the list where these tangles show up. But I think the most instructive is what I'm going to say next about boxers, football players, and soldiers. They all have repeated traumatic brain injuries. And they all, many of them, I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them develop these fatal tauopathies. Now, what happens in these tauopathies? What happens is that in the frontal lobes where there's intellect, uh, memory, and really the frontal lobes keep us from acting quite crazy. And we know a lot about frontal lobe symptoms now from people like Bruce Miller, who've studied lots and lots of patients over the past 20 years. And we know that when the red region in the front becomes destroyed by disease, by the deposition of more and more tau protein to form these tangles, that the personality changes of the individual, behavior and language change. And these behavioral changes that range from lethargy to disinhibition to apathy to becoming socially withdrawn, wide mood swings from euphoria to depression, and often suicide occurs. And then we see people with drug addiction and alcoholism, which is being studied extensively, as John DeLuca mentioned, by the Gallo Center at UCSF. Uh, it's become clear that this, there's a whole set of diseases called the tauopathies which is at this interface between psychiatry and neurology. Very often, these patients end up in psychiatrist's office, not neurologist's office, even though we would argue this is a neurologic disease. And what you're really seeing is you're seeing this joining of psychiatry and neurology to become neuropsychiatry the way it was for 100 years 
before World War II. So from the, from the time of the Civil War until up to World War II, most people who worked with nervous system problems were neuropsychiatrists. So we're seeing a change that's happening in front of us, and this is, this is at the center of it. And this is a young man who was at the University of Pennsylvania, a very smart young man who played football from high school. And in April of 2010, so a year ago, he committed suicide by hanging himself. He was not depressed that anybody knew about, but I'm sure he was, and it just wasn't recognized. And here you see his brain, and you see these little brown areas, and we also see that, his, that we see these wide regions, like an Alzheimer's disease, so some of his brain is actually atrophied. But these holes within the brown regions, now they're blown up hundreds of times in a microscope, you see these tangles, tons of tau in the nerve cells, and you see the tau radiating out in all directions from this point of impact. But this is an invisible impact. Nothing went into his brain. His head was hit, his helmet was hit multiple times throughout his life. Now, we've seen this in college players now, and there's a series of 50 football players that will be published soon, uh, both from the pros, where there's a dozen of them already recorded in the literature. And I don't know the results of the autopsy yet of David Dewerson. He died a month ago. And he played football for Notre Dame. His life was chronicled in the New York Times in February, as many of you read about him. He was an honor student in economics, went on to play for the Chicago Bears, the New York Giants, and the Phoenix Cardinals. He then retired in 1993, and over the next six, seven years, with three McDonald's restaurants and a farm, he started Dewerson Foods. His business grew from 24 million a year to over 60 million a year. In, 19, in 2006, his company went bankrupt. And the next year, his, there was foreclosure on his home in Highland Park, Illinois. He pleaded guilty to a charge of domestic violence. He divorced his wife, or I should say she divorced him. And then on the 18th of February of this year, he texted his friend saying he wanted his brain studied for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is the chronic form of this traumatic brain injury where more and more tau is deposited. And he shot himself in the chest so his brain would be preserved. Well, it's not confined to football players, but we're learning a lot. The other place this is happening is to soldiers. And it's a different kind of head injury. And it's only different, not in the end result, but in how it happens. So instead of a rabies virus, instead of a measles virus, instead of Alzheimer's disease, or instead of having your head collide with someone else's head, these helmet-to-helmet -helmet collisions, uh, what's happening to these soldiers is that they're nearby a giant blast, such as the one pictured in Baghdad right here. Now, this is an old study done by the military in 1965 on the Hawaiian Islands, where they blew up a tremendous amount of explosive here, and you're seeing this 30 seconds later. After the blast has moved from this point where all the fire is, out to this ship and beyond, and what it did as, it, as this shock wave moved across the water is it vaporized the water, and you see all the water vapor here. And the reason I know that it's not happening, the picture isn't simultaneous with the blast in the beginning is that the water vapor would be along the ocean. We're seeing bigger and bigger roadside bombs in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're seeing more and more, this is 10,000 right here per year, it's now over 30,000 concussions per year. We're recognizing these, so that's part of the increase, but we're seeing bigger and bigger problems. And these blast injuries come, we don't understand the details of what happens inside the head, but we understand what's happening subsequent to this. And one of the things that does happen is that this shock wave is so massive is that it passes through the head it stops all the blood from going to the brain, and then as it gets further through and passes by, there's a vacuum that's created and the blood rushes in. But that's just an immediate problem. The big problem is the tau protein and the changes in behavior. 
So what's happening in these tauopathies is that the red form is being converted into this precursor, the green one, and this goes around and around in a cycle. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to develop drugs in this new building that work at positions one, two, and three in this cycle. So we're either trying to decrease the precursor, block this conversion, or clear out the red square. And how do we do that? We do that through modern drug discovery. This is science. This is not serendipity. It's not luck. And we go through a whole series of steps. And I'm showing you these steps with cultured cells in which we're looking for compounds that will decrease the amount of tau. And when we move from there, we make many, many analogs. So we make many different versions of the same compound, or similar compounds, I should say. And then we go into mice and we test them in mice, and that's where we are, and soon, we hope, we'll be at the point of testing them in people. Now, I can't sh go through an entire uh, presentation without showing you a few chemical structures, but you don't have to take notes. <laughs> this just shows you the pipeline that I showed you in the last slide now, going from these massive libraries of thousands and tens of thousands of compounds, which we now want to expand to millions because this is a numbers game. And if you don't do enough, you don't end up with enough compounds that can make it through these tests in mice and go into people. Now, this is a complicated process, and it requires a lot of very smart people to do this, all with different skills. And what I'm showing you here are 14 different groups of chemicals. They're along the bottom with all these long, uh, difficult names. And then I'm showing you that within each of these bars, we now look at, the, at a whole variety of chemicals that will inhibit the production of this tau protein. And from that, we can decide if we change this oxygen or this hydrogen or this nitrogen or this carbon and we move it over here or move it there, we can make something better. And that's the process that we go through. Now, we're also in need of diagnostics. And we're in need of methods to evaluate just how good these new medicines will be. And the only way we can do that is to image the brain. And the only way we can image the brain and look at single proteins like tau is to use what's called PET scanning or positron emission tomography, or the long name. How do we do this? We have to find chemicals that will report out how much tau there is. And they have to cross into the brain. And then we, lab we label them so we can see them in this scanner. And so we can use them for diagnosis, and we can use them to evaluate the treatment uh, quantitatively. So what Catherine mentioned, coming back to this building at Mission Bay, we're dedicated to, these new, to entering this really new area, to creating therapies, because there's not a single therapy out there. It's not just for Alzheimer's disease anymore. It's for young people who are athletes. We have 4.4 million people playing football in the United States, if you can believe that number. But we have thousands and thousands of soldiers with concussions. Over 200,000 from the Iraq and Afghanistan campaign have been documented concussions. So we have a huge invisible problem going on in the heads of large, large numbers of people. And this new building promises us to let us bring exceptionally talented people uh, and create collaborations not only within universities, but also within industry. This is the building. It's, the structure is up, but now it will take another year to finish the inside of it, and it'll be open in April, and I hope all of you will come to the groundbreaking. And Carol Moss will send you an invitation, along with Sue Hellman and Sam Hawgood. So our goal is to create the first effective therapeutics for neurodegeneration, which is an expanding problem. As I said, we need to assemble really talented scientists. And we need to not only create drugs, but we have to have ways of knowing whether these drugs are effective by using PET scans. That's the normal brain. I want to close 
by saying a word about the larger University of California that Mark Udoff is responsible for, as well as the regents. I think unquestionably UC is the most outstanding public university in the world. I don't think anybody argues with that. And UC educates numerous future leaders of our nation and the world. And it continues to be an extraordinary engine of discovery and innovation. And in these times of state budget cuts, support from generous individuals and foundations has become increasingly important. And investing in the future breakthroughs can only be done by encouraging students and faculty to think differently. And I believe this is really the message that I wanted to get across to you, which I think is so crucial. Thank you for listening.